Today we'll talk about spec flow and gherkin and uh, some things I uh, picked up uh, using those. But let me stress one thing if I can get my clicker to work. <coughs> Come on, don't fail me now. Yeah. So specification by example. Yeah. Uh, Come on. Yes, it's on. Uh, specification by example, as we talked about yesterday, is not about the tools, it's about communication. And we, uh, we paused uh, around that for a while and talked about that a lot of the patterns that Goika has talked about actually is useful with, without even implementing them and without any technology. So it's really important that you understand that, that this BDD and specification is around communication and understanding each other. And with that out of the way, let's talk about the tools. <laughs> so this will be all about the tooling, uh, because there is a lot of tooling. So if you haven't met me, my name is Marcus. Uh, uh, I work for this place. I have one wife, two hobbies, three kids. I've been a programmer since 1998 working mainly on the Microsoft stack. Uh, but the last eight years I've been more and more interested in working effectively together with agile methods such as Scrum and Kanban. The reason for me doing these presentations is that I'm uh, moving abroad and I wanted to give them a one last time. I'm moving to this place called uh, uh, Bandung in Indonesia. And now I see that we have an extra slide, sorry. I would I should not I will not talk about that today. Here is the one. Yeah. So uh, as I said, BDD is not about the tools, but we will to, uh, focus on them today. And one of the good things about using Cucumber uh, or Specflow, as it's called on the Microsoft stack, is that that's a tool that's actually implemented in very similar manner on all platforms. So all the things that I will mention about Specflow today can be applied if you're using Cucumber for Java or if you're using Cucumber for Ruby and there's even a JavaScript version of Cucumber right now. So uh, the language that you write your specifications is, in, is exactly the same all over the, plat all over the platforms. And they work in a very similar manner. So each line in the in a, uh, specification is called a step, and that calls into a. Oh my God! That was <laughs> my early animation techniques in Keynote. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so that calls into a specific uh, a line in your code called a step definition. And in Specflow, there's actually a number of ways to do this, uh, but. Uh, for the most part, you can just focus on setting an attribute that indicates which uh, which specification, uh, which line in your specification you you uh, want to uh, run. So it doesn't really care about the name on your methods. You could have it care about the name in your methods if you want to, but I don't use that feature. And uh, it works like this. Uh, it's executed by the test runner and that calls into your test uh, definition clause. That's important to understand because that means that the test runner is not actually important for us. So we can have spec flow running our n unit test, ms test, x unit test. It's not important. So I don't really care. I use n unit because that's default. Uh, <coughs> all right. So the step definitions, uh, yeah, sorry, this is also an old slide that we talked about. Gherkin is the language, let's jump to that instead and I get my slides in order. So Gherkin is the language that you call, uh, that you write your specifications in, in Cucumber. His obsession with Cucumbers has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the uh, specifications. I think it was his wife actually, Aslak Hellese is the inventor of Cucumber, and he asked his wife what she, he should call this new tool that he was working on. And he, she was very fed up with his, him being into the code, so he, she, she just said, call it Cucumber, and hence it become like that. So Gherkin, that's a really small language actually, this is about all of it. Uh, so it's a really just a couple of, uh, couple of verbs here, uh, a couple of words here and a couple of keywords uh, above. And that's good news for us because that means that we can translate it easy. 
So it's actually translated into 37 uh, different uh, uh, spoken languages. Uh, some of which are a bit confusing. <laughs> I don't know who would ever, uh, and this is just, I mean, I don't need, even know who speaks that. But, but you could write your specifications in this language if you want to. Uh, the specifications are written in a feature file, and uh, a feature file has a title like this, and then it has an area here where you can write whatever you want. That's also important to know, and I think most people miss that, because uh, uh, Cucumber will not care. It will pick up the feature name, to use for reporting, and then it will not care what you write here until the first scenario. So you could write whatever you want there. You can do links to other documents. You could do, uh, write a, a really long uh, uh, specification uh, background if you want to, or you can do tables. Uh, I've seen people uh, starting to mix in uh, links to images and stuff like that. So you can add, have whatever you want in there. So please use that uh, to give as much background as needed to understand the scenarios. So we talked about that yesterday. You don't want to cross-reference a lot of different scenarios, uh, features in order to understand this feature. So put as much in there that, as you need to. Me using user stories like this is just because that's what I'm usually using, but you don't, there's no reason for you to do that. You can write just flowing text if you want to. All right, uh, then we come to scenario, and there can be one or more scenarios in each feature file. And uh, they also have, have a title, and the title is pretty important for a scenario. That you want that to be a summarizing, summarization of what is this scenario doing. So I have a little metaphor that I use, and that's from the Friends episode. Who is a Friends fan here? You know, every episode is called the one where, and then something happens. So I, I usually think that if I put the one where before my scenario titles, then I end up with a pretty good scenario title. So, for example, the one where successfully draw from a country with is incredible. The one where Ross meets Rachel. <laughs> the one where Ross and Rachel breaks up. That's pretty much half the episodes. All right. Uh, the steps. Uh, as we talked about, is uh, is uh, written like this, and Cucumber will pick up the scenario, and then it will just go through each step. And there is a name for it here, if it's a given, if a when, or a then, and then some text, whatever text you want to write there. The order of this is not important. You can write it in any order you want to. You don't, you don't have to start with a given. You can start with a when. But it sends some intent, right? So we want the givens to be to set up our system in the, in the state that we want to execute the scenario in. So given this is the state that the system is in, and we want to have a single when line, because we want to do one action that we trigger the system in, and then we can have multiple then. For readability, you can use and and but. Actually, I've never used but. Anyone used but? No? So you can use and. And that links into whatever it stands before. So this will be just another then statement, right? But as you understand, I could as easily have written when, 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 when. But that would not have been very readable. So to help me understand, I have used given when then, but it's not really important from a technical perspective. You, uh, you hinder me when I'm saying things that you don't agree with. Uh, luckily for us, uh, Cucumber supports expressions, so we can actually, uh, we don't have to do a step definition for every uh, single version of that, but we can instead use a regular expression in here and get, uh, get the variables sent to us. I've been using Specflow now for four years, I think, and these two are the only ones that I've been using, actually. Uh, there's other ways of getting uh, fully blown objects as in here as well. I'll see if I can uh, show you that, but these are pretty much what I use and I, they serve me well. Uh, background, that's statements that run before every scenario. It's a bit like a test setup. Uh, don't put 
too much information there about how the system is to be to be set up. It's uh, more of things that you realize that you're doing on every scenario. You, it might be better to have uh, several features instead, so it's easy to read them. If you have one background and then 55 uh, scenarios, that gets really hard to remember what's happening up there. So just put a couple of statements in there. Never put a when statement in there. That's stupid. Sorry. <laughs> One feature that a lot of people don't use is called hooks. And that's a, a, a number of events that, that is triggered when you run Cucumber or SpecFlow then. Uh, so you get one event before a test run, all the tests in the suite are run before each feature, before each scenario, before each scenario block that, it, that is before, uh, bef uh, uh, before statement or uh, uh, before uh, if you run several of them in, in a uh, scenario outline and before each step even and then of course after all of these that's pretty cool because now you can hook in and do logging and do other stuff that you can that you want to do beyond these uh, places you might want to set up the system in a certain state before each feature maybe something like that but it becomes even cooler when you combine it with tags and tags are just some some really simple uh, you write an at symbol and then you write some text you can write whatever you want there's only one supported out of the box guess what that do <laughs> uh, so that's supported out of the box but you can write whatever you want to and you can use that um, I've gone crazy with the animations on this slide, sorry. Uh, you can use that, so you can have, this is run before every, all scenarios, regardless of their tags. But this method is just run before the scenarios that have the test tag 1 for, on it. So I've been using things like uh, restore database, that's the tag for me. Another thing that's worth noting, and this is of course run with, with the, the, before each scenario that have all of these, I think, or is it one of the, the or, mm, all of them? Or, or, yeah, or, so some of them. Yeah. So in this case, both these will be run. Uh, so you can do a lot of things with them. Another thing worth mentioning about tags is that they end up becoming something called a test category if you're running, uh, that's MS test MS lingua, I think. Yeah. So, so you can start to filter out tests. That's really useful, if I back up a bit here, because then we can indicate that this test runs against the UI. So we may run all our tests with, except those that run against the UI on every check-in, but the <coughs> UI test will run only daily. Uh, other things that I have seen is tagging, uh, tagging scenarios with sprint numbers. So this was created in sprint 32. We tag them with uh, the Kanban column. So oh yeah, so it's in this column right now. Yeah. Good, awesome. I've seen the WIP as well, work in process. And we talked about that yesterday actually, about a, a firm called Songkick that disabled all their scenarios when they were done. We can talk about that afterwards. So, but they ran all the scenarios with a WIP tag. So WIP work in process, we run them, uh, run them all the time, run them all the time, uh, and then when we're done with it, we put the, this is done, so we don't run it un unless someone explicitly asks for just this scenario. Uh, column on the Kanban board, that's good. Any other creative use for this? You can go really, it, it can become a mess, this, so go easy, don't go uh, use them too uh, liberally, but uh, it can also be very, very useful actually. Tables is a really good thing because then you can start to have uh, more data sent to you, and that's sent to you as a spec flow table in which you can pick out the columns and uh, values, of course, but that's not as cool as using spec flow assist. And this is also very uh, convoluted in a strange sort of way because you have to in use that statement before these, uh, that, uh, that namespace before this method occurs. But here you can see that we get the spec flow table sent to us and then we can create a list of persons from that table. So it automatically maps it and it's also comparing for you if you want to. 
And if you're really cool and use a little uh, utility that I've written, then you can actually skip having uh, DTOs to ma and do dynamics instead. So here you see that I have a dynamic instance. So I'm mapping it from a table right to the dynamic instant and then I'm just using the names from the table right here. So I don't have to have a little class that I'm actually mapping to. Alright, I'm going very fast. Please stop me if you want to. But I, this, I didn't say that in the beginning, but this uh, presentation has two parts. First is introduction in part to SpecFlow and Gherkin. And then we'll take a look at some a great way of actually structuring your code. I hope you find it great as much. So, Scenario Outline is one very powerful feature in which you can use uh, variables in your scenario. So, it's Scenario Outline here, abstract scenario for some strange reason in Swedish. I think they've changed that actually to something. There's also uh, scenarios, I think you can use scenarios, and then it's uh, you have your examples down here. So this would be run one, two, three, four, five times, picking up its values by mapping these, like this. So that's a really, really powerful way of introducing more examples. So what I often end up with is my, maybe uh, when we are doing a specification workshop, we have maybe one or two of these. Uh, or only one maybe, and then we, uh, I write them out as a uh, scenario outline and we add examples afterwards because it's the same uh, step definition so it's easy, it's, it's a cheap way to add more examples to your specification. Again, don't be too liberal because they can be very hard to read if this table is extremely long. <coughs> don't go over six or seven columns is my, my suggestions and maybe six or seven rows also is a is a, a good stopping point because otherwise it, it tends to be very hard to read. My experience is that business people, especially if they are uh, familiar with the Excel and stuff like that, they, are, uh, they pick up this really easy. So it's easy to start because this is like uh, they always, often say, this is just like an equation, right? Yeah, you can understand that. So. As I told you, an awesome thing about Gherkin is that it's easy tra to translate. So you could actually, in your specification, you could write language as a comment. This is comments, and you just write uh, language svenska, and then you use Swedish instead. Uh, you could also add that in your config file, which is more, more common, of course, because I suspect that most uh, people use the same language throughout all their specifications. Uh, finally, I want to say one thing, uh, thing more, and that's that you have a little utility called Scenario Context, uh, where you can find information about the scenario in question, uh, but it has a dictionary called Current. Uh, so you can put stuff in there. So here you see that I'm creating a new person based on the uh, name I got there, and I store it into the person. And there's two ways of into the uh, current dictionary. There's two ways of doing that. Again, you have to include a specflow assist namespace, but then you get uh, get typed methods in which you can just store your, uh, your things like that, or you use the dictionary keys and then you can extract it the same way. This is actually the preferred way of doing it and it helps a lot if you do that instead of having private variables in your, in your clause. The reason for that is that you want these steps to be as... Uh, um, uh, what's the name? You want them to be as isolated as possible so you can run them in another order maybe or run them as part of another scenario. And if you do that and you have private variables, then it's important in which class you have your steps and things like that. So by using uh, the scenario uh, context.current, you can actually have much more freedom in where you place your steps. I often group my steps uh, together with the, the, the entity or feature that they are around. So I have customer steps or uh, reporting steps and things like that. Uh, I prefer the typed version of this, but you can of course use any uh, old version you like. So I've been going on for 19 minutes. Yeah, let me, I think we have time for a few things that I want to show you.
I was thinking about doing this all in code, but I didn't dare. Ah! <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> my, my virtual machine died on me two days from now. So, uh, one thing that is really powerful is uh, step transformations. This is powerful also, but I would recommend against it. You can actually call into other steps. If you inherit from the steps class, then you can write stuff like this. Uh, I'll just do it here. Uh, when anybody come come up with a, a, thing, a place where that is suitable, it's recommended against, and I can see why because you tie it very tightly together. But one thing that you could do is actually have two ways of describing your specifications. You have one more technical version and one more a higher level version. Then you could maybe use this. I have never used it actually. Uh, another thing that most people don't take into account is that you can actually have several of these. So you can... Uh, this is one thing that I've been using a lot actually. So I have... This is called for you, now I can use this step for givens, whens, and thens. So that, and, and of course I change my my uh, formulations in there to, in order to make it uh, a good uh, sentence. But it's really powerful because now often it is just one single uh, statement that I want to execute from all my steps. So that's a thing that I uh, tend to forget from time to time. Uh, step transformations is a great little thing where you can do something like this. Uh, so you see, I have a statement there. Given that something has been... Let's see the feature instead. That's easier to understand, I think. Given Dan has been registered at date and then a date. You know about this, right? You can uh, go to the step definition. F12, if you're in Visual Studio. I have not done much for spec for Specflow, but I've done that. <laughs> I done that, and the first version of this was mine as well. I was really proud about that. <laughs> so we can ah uh, multiple step found for that specific one. But so now I can take just a string and then another string and convert them to dates and my user. And that is actually simply done by having a little converter clause. Don't forget this binding attribute on that clause. I always do that and, and uh, don't remember why it doesn't uh, convert. So this takes the string that we have and it creates a new user based on that string. You could maybe send in a, a string here and pick it up from a database if you want to instead, if you have a database of test data. So th this is a really powerful way of having much easier, uh, much easier steps. Because your steps now look just like this. So I just get the user and that's handled somewhere else. So that, that's a, a powerful feature. That I'll see if I have one thing more. <laughs> that I wanted to, you to see. No, I don't think we need to. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to this uh, later, actually, but... Uh, uh, there's a little IOC container in, in Specflow, in fact. So, class is marked with binding, that's the trigger for Specflow. Uh, can actually take, in their constructor, can, can, constructor can take uh, parameters. I'm using that a lot, almost every time, and I'll soon show you where. This is not a good example, it's just a made up example, but it, it's really useful. And it's a fully blown, no it's not, but it, it's a, it, it has more feature than meets the eye, because this context can in turn have par parameters to its constructor. So as long as there's some uh, parameterless constructor in the end, you can actually resolve some pretty compli complex objects. That's really powerful for a certain thing. I'm ho holding you on the bench for a while, but I'll show you that soon. Uh, where is it? Did, am I just telling you stuff that you knew? 
Uh oh. <laughs> Good. So I've created a little demo. Uh, uh, this talk will be recorded and I'll put my slides up on SlideShare so you don't have to write anything down. But I put uh, my, my demos here. That's showing off almost every feature of Specflow. I try to keep it in sync. So you can see that. Uh, all right, uh, this spring I got the opportunity to spring, uh, we're not switching gears and talking about ways to organize the automation code because that's where most people trip up. Uh, me too, uh, and we all do, do that, but uh, we need to be very mindful about how we write those codes and a few simple tricks have helped me a lot to improve that. And um, this uh, spring I um, got uh, the opportunity to speak at Skills Matter, a little education company in, uh, in uh, London that have done a lot for uh, Cucumber, in fact. They have a little conference called Cuke Up. <laughs> uh, for Swedes, this is really funny. Don't try to explain that to Englishmen, though they won't get it. Because I, I uh, proposed this talk, <laughs> King Envy, which uh, they didn't get at all. They were like, oh man. <laughs> this talk tried to mimic, there's a guy that's, he's the lead programmer for QCAM right now, he's called Matt Wynn. He has given a lot of really great presentations. I have links to the three I like the most at the end. And in one of them, he showed a really nice way of structuring your code in Ruby. So that was like a challenge to me, so I tried to do that in uh, .NET. In, uh, and I actually got around to it by using Nancy. Nancy has some feature that's really nice, so I'll show them off. But it's a great way of actually structuring your code. There's nothing strange in here, it's layering that we've been used to, but you want your Gherkin's specifications to be the same regardless about, of how your system is implemented. We talked about that yesterday after the presentation. So this should not change if, I, if it's a Windows application or if it's a web application or if it's a mobile application or if it's not an, even an application. I might go up to Osa and ask her for 50 euros, right? Because this, uh, yeah, 20 dollars. <laughs> this, is, this is actually business roots. So, and, and you, the first time you start to do this, you end up in automating your system instead. You have a step that says, when I click this, when I choose this, when I navigate to this page. That should actually be hidden. And we're talking in, uh, in the Cucumber community, we're talking about pushing the how down the stack. So a really good thing that uh, Matt said was that you want to keep your step definitions a one-liner. And in order to have them a one-liner, you need to propagate everything down to a, some kind of DSL that you use for automating your system. I've changed vocabulary here, so I call it a dri driver nowadays. <coughs> but so, so I write up, and I, th this is programming by intention, you, you know that from TV. So it would be lovely if I had a method that was called withdraw, that just withdrew the amount that I sent to it. I don't know how yet, but that would be great, right? So I can write a little DSL for me to automating my system. I'm yet not talking about how I'm automating, right? I can go against my domain objects, or I can go against my web page, or I can go against my mobile phone, or I can maybe have a print a test script from this and then run it manually. That sounds really stupid. <laughs> but, uh, uh, in the DSL, now we're talking, now we can use, now we can start to do, uh, uh, do some automation, but still here, I would suggest that you, you do wrappers around, if you're automating a web page, for example, do a little wrapper class around that page that hides the complexity on how you, sh how you should uh, automate. So you see here that I have a private method called the page wrapper, and it just withdraw. To this method, I just got the amount, so then I use the default account number and the default PIN number. I can have overloads here that take account number and PIN codes as well, but for now I'm using this. I'm using this. And then we get into automation code, and that is the page wrapper. So in here we do all the funky stuff with uh, Selenium or whatever we're, we're up to. And then finally we hit our system on the test. I had to use this short version even though it was not that. Um, 
so uh, when I did this presentation I only had 20 minutes to go and I couldn't stand me typing that fast so I prepared all the code and I so I'll do this here as well I'll just walk you through how this look uh, ah. hey what's happening sorry here we go So again, I often uh, structure my specifications uh, project like this. Specs, steps, and support code. Uh, so in the, in the specs, that's on, only my feature files. And as you can see here, it's, uh, it doesn't say anything about how the system is implemented. And a good lackmus test for that is actually to think about what if this was a Windows application? What if this was a mobile application? Would this change? If so, we probably need to change it. It shouldn't say anything about that. You'd be surprised on how many scenarios that is uh, actually not interesting when you start to think like that. Yesterday I got a suggestion for, so when I click on the inbox, my inbox messages should be shown. Is that really a business function that we're, do you want to spend time automating that? Not really, maybe. When I archive a message, if it's responded to, I shouldn't be able to archive it. That's a business rule that we want to spend time on. All right, uh, and then we have our steps. And here you see uh, that my steps is just one line, a single line in each step, and I'm propagating into something called a driver. And this is where I'm using the injection part of uh, the injection capabilities of uh, uh, Cucumber, or Specflow rather. Because now I can inject my driver, so I don't have to resolve it, I don't have to create it in, in this uh, method, and I don't have to tie it directly. So that's good, I'm just injecting it, saving it, saving it into a step. The drivers are in my uh, support code, and I've created three of them. So let's take a look at, and that was just for my uh, demo purposes, but you could actually start out dri driving your spec against your domain objects, maybe. And then, uh, and then against your HTML later. That's awesome because now you're in a situation where you can actually switch between these. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, it, makes, it makes for a great demo as well. So here is also my, uh, my domain driver. So I create an in-memory cache dispenser, an account builder. We don't have to dwell on this topics right now. But you can see here, again, as I said, to you earlier that the, the, this will be resolved by uh, Specflow's built-in uh, IOC container. Gaspar will hit me if I call that the IOC container, but <laughs> it, it is some sort of that. So the, it will resolve this in-memory cache dispenser, whatever that is, and the account builder. We'll take a look at that one because that's interesting. Uh, as long as they have uh, public constructors with no parameters or internally depending on stuff so you understand uh, somewhere you have to tell them uh, how it, this is resolved. Uh, and this becomes very easy then in the, uh, in the domain uh, version because I can now just uh, set up my, my uh, account in the way I want it to and uh, and then uh, try to do the withdrawal method that actually does the automation. So I try to use my mock repository uh, and I create some kind of sort of teller service. I spec this out. So this was actually this was actually done a bit like TDD. I found out what I needed to do before that. And when I now, if I, we now go back here to the feature. We can we run. Let's run just that scenario. <coughs> Does it run all of them now? So the good thing about going through the, to the domain is that it's super fast to run them, right? As long as we're doing the correct thing. So I'm just running one now. So this is all in memory and everything is super fast. So. As long as we get it up and running, it just takes a couple of, sec a couple of milliseconds. So we can have loads of these. 
The bad things about this is that we haven't tested the whole system, right? This is just the domain, so will it be shown on the page? Stuff like that. But with this structure that I uh, recommended you now, you're in a situation where you, there's, easy, there's uh, quite easy for you to write yet another driver. Let's write a driver that hits uh, the web page instead. And I, when, when you do this, you actually end up with, okay, so now I need to fill out these methods because you have an API for how you're going to automate your system. So now we can, uh, we can take a look at the, this driver, the driver for the HTML code. And so this will use a page wrapper and then the account builder. And the page wrapper in turn will We'll, we'll use something, uh, if you haven't used that, take a look at Fluent Automation. That's a really nice way of automating your code. So you see here, I will open the URL and I will fill out the form and everything. And fingers crossed, this will work. This was one of the things that I, I need to build and... Don't worry, this is supposed to happen. So now I run the exactly the same. Uh, the, it's the, exactly the same feature. It's also the exactly the same steps, just using another driver which I'm injecting. So the steps hasn't changed. That's a, that's a really good thing, and that's also where you want to end up. So now I'm automating in a completely different manner. I'm just using a different driver for that. I mean, we can even see scenarios where you can switch this if you want to uh, on your build server. So we run all, all our builds against the domain, and then we run the, you, as we talked about, the ta that those that are tagged with uh, this sprint, for example, we run them against the, the domain, uh, against the HTML. So fingers crossed. So what I'm doing now is I'm hitting the, the real database, injecting stuff, uh, setting up uh, tables and uh, data in the tables. This is what's happening now. And then I will be opening Chrome and I will go serve to the page, but you can see that this already takes much, way, way longer. If you have 600 tests, you don't want that to be happening for every test. Then you just end up in a, way, in a place where, yeah. I didn't say it was pretty. <laughs> so, main point here, it's the same feature, it's the same steps. And that's, that's not uh, something to strive for in itself, but it, it gives for a really nice uh, structuring of your, of your code. If you're using Nancy, like I am, then you're in a wonderful uh, place, because Nancy supports, uh, how many knows about Nancy? Nancy is like Sinatra, if you've used, uh, heard about Sinatra, it's a minimalistic web framework. Nancy supports something great, and that is that you can run it in memory. So you can actually, without any web server, if you want to, you can actually get an in-memory representation of the page back for, uh, from what you uh, sent in. So you can say stuff like, uh, yeah, I did, even did a wrapper for that module. So here you can see me posting a form. So I'm posting a form and in the, uh, let's see where that is. Oh yeah, yeah this was even cooler actually because now I can do, a, I can do a, in memory a fake implementation of one of my ex external dependencies and verify against that mock, against that fake, instead. But as you could see there, I used, I left that in here. We could actually do validations with uh, CSS selectors on the, on the in-memory uh, representation of the page that is returned to us. This is a Nancy feature. There's been, uh, there's been uh, uh, trials to make that happen for uh, for uh, MVC as well. It's called Crowbar. Check that out. It's pretty cool, but uh, it's hard to get it working and it's actually... Have you tried it? No. no. It's actually way slow. That's the problem with it, right? right? It takes about f five seconds to set up the, the application domain. So It's cool. Uh, 
And now we end up in the best of both worlds, right? Because now we're testing the complete stack. I'm hitting the database. I'm actually hitting my database driver. I'm, of course, using simple data, Hugo. And that supports in-memory in an in memory adapter. So I'm, I'm hitting my SQL code against an in-memory database. And I'm hitting my uh, web server just before it actually handed off to my web server. So I'm hitting my web application and get an in-memory representation back. So I'm testing the full stack, but in memory. And as you can see, that didn't take very long compared to the full HTML page. Only available if your web framework supports this in a beautiful way like Nancy does. So that's a, a really cool demo, but again, I want to underline that the, the main thing here is actually that you want for, for me, the, the, the easiest way to remember this is to have my step definitions be a one-liner. Because then that means that I need to propagate it into something that actually drives out my uh, specification. And I don't want my feature to change if I change the underlying uh, application. And I want my steps to be one-liners. Then you end up in a pretty good state. Question, Marcus. Yes. If you were going to do this in the hooks, how would you... In hooks. Uh, this part, yeah, yeah. so uh, then you probably need to take a look on how Gaspar has implemented his IOC container. Okay. You could actually, in the, you could configure the IOC container to say, in this case, use this, uh, this dependency. Mm -hmm. So you could use different dependencies depending on which tag you had. Okay. I haven't looked into that, but uh, it, should be, it should be very, not be hard to figure that out. Uh, I wrote a blog post about that the IOC containers. You can find out how it actually works. With the, there's a special method that where you can configure it. So let let's wrap this up. It is a lunch lecture, right? Uh, and go back to my slides. So this thing helped me with a great structure. Just if nothing else, just the folders and th where things go. That's a really good way to get started. And also the good things about thinking, uh, yeah, that I to told you about coding by intention. You can make up this DSL, this driver object, as you code it. So I often do that when I, you know, you take the specification and the first thing you do is just spec out the, the driver object. That driver object, by the way, could be done by a TDD if you want to. We could even, even test that driver object if you wanted to. Keeping in mind to push the how down my stack. I want it as low as possible because if it's not th there, then the brittleness of any automation, because an automation is actually writing a program that poking another program in some way. You need some kind of glue. There is a glue there in per definition. You want that as far down as possible because if you change that, you don't want to change all the way up through the stack. You want that encapsulated nicely in a page wrapper, for example. Otherwise, you end up with brittle test and brittle test will not be run. I've seen 400 specifications, uh, 400 feature files that have never been run during the last six months. And they are as bad as a Word document. Right? We don't know if they are real or not. There might be, but nobody can really tell. And this DSL swap that you were talking about, yeah, that could be cool. For, for now, I've only tried it out as a demo, actually. Uh, it, the best thing would be to try to find a suitable level where you test enough of your stack to be feel secure, but also uh, have uh, your execution time in mind, because it's the same thing. <coughs> Slow tests, they won't be run. We will we'll stop running them, I promise you. And I don't know what slow is, but 10 minute build, you have heard that term? Something like that, I think. These are the tools that I've used. Specflow, we talked a lot about that. Nancy, I cannot talk a lot, uh, enough about that. <laughs> Simple data is a really nice little data access tool. And then take a look at Fluent Automation. That's a really cool uh, thing. Uh, they even have a, like a console where you can actually write code uh, to, uh, that automates your application on the fly. So you can try out your automation code 
uh, on beforehand. So that's really cool. Another great thing that is about this is that it actually wraps selenium and, and wattin. You don't have to bother yourself with those. So you can switch them if you, for some reason, can't find your selectors array. That code can be found here. You can learn a lot more about this stuff. Uh, so, uh, if, you, if you want the, the introduction to BDD, read that post. Cukes info, there's a lot of words here that I, 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 I couldn't say in short, right? So, Cukes info, that's the official Cucumber site for some reason. Here's my demos that I talked about. Uh, this is a really hilarious uh, uh, presentation, refactoring your cukes. <laughs> Again, uh, and uh, this, uh, these two are by Matt Wynn, and that's the presentation where, on, on which I built my, my stuff. So th that's really good, really good stuff in there. This is my attempt to mimic that. There's a number of books. Yesterday I talked about specification by example, that it's nothing about technology in there. Cucumber, the cucumber book and the cucumber recipes. These are great. And they are also good because you can read them if you're using Specflow. You can read them if you're using Cucumber.js. The things they talk about is the same all across every platform. You might need to jump through some hoops to get it to work on, uh, on uh, 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 Specflow, by, for example, because in Ruby they have in the Ruby Cucumber, they have something called the world object in which they can attach anything to. We don't have things like that, and that messes up stuff for us quite a lot. Mm. Uh, but uh, if you try, really try to, you can find really good... You don't have to look for good things in here, but if you try to, you can mimic them on your platform. So uh, I, I would recommend this very much. I have read that too. It's also good, but it's more about you, uh, Ruby in that in that one. Thank you for listening. On your way out, please give me some feedback on the board. And uh, as always, the recording of this talk will be found here when Anders' daughter has uh, went through the 8.4 gigabyte file. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening.